We are fortunate today to have a team of experts here to discuss uh, measuring walkability in urban sprawl. Uh, Dr. Dan Fuller and Dr. Henry Luan um, and Dr. Nancy Ross and Thomas Herman. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Henry, a postdoc working with Dr. Daniel Fuller at Memorial University. So my presentation today is Urban Sprawl in Canada, a nationwide spatial analysis at the census tract level. Uh, so this research explores the spatial patterns of urban sprawl in Canada at a small area level with a robust spatial statistical modeling approach. So the aim of this webinar is to give you an idea of the background of this research. Uh, the data and methods used to uh, create the composite urban sprawl score and some preliminary findings. And finally, I will introduce the challenges we had and discuss the next steps of this research. Uh, first, some background information. Uh, currently, there is, uh, there is no consensus on the definition of urban sprawl. A uh, generally accepted definition is that urban sprawl is the inefficient, unordered, and unorganized urban growth and it manifests in the forms of, uh, for example, uh, decentralization, fragmentation, and low density of residents. And this is also how we identify uh, relevant sprawl indicators, uh, which will be shown in the following slides. So uh, the negative impact of urban sprawl has been widely acknowledged in the literature. And there is a, a lot of evidence that urban sprawl contributes to uh, increased energy use uh, air pollution, traffic congestion, and decreased community cohesiveness. And in the public health literature, studies have found that uh, urban sprawl is significantly uh, associated with physical inactivity uh, and PMI and other chronic disease, such as uh, heart disease. Next slide, please. So given uh, urban sprawl's negative impact, many researchers have uh, measured urban sprawl with different uh, quantitative methods aiming to uh, inform health, health interventions and urban design. Uh, but there are several limitations in the existing uh, urban sprawl studies. First, there is no nationwide urban sprawl index for Canada at a small area level, and most scores have been created at the large area level. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, census metropolitan area. This kind of index uh, cannot well represent resident day-to-day -day activities. So it is a crude uh, explanatory variable in the statistical analysis. Uh, another limitation is that non-spatial statistical approaches have been used. This might not be an issue uh, if the uh, composite index is created at the large area levels, but could be an issue at small area levels due to uh, spatial correlation, uh, which means uh, nearby areas have similar uh, ha uh, have similar sprawl values. So ignoring this spatial correlation issue could lead to uh, biased findings. But also, uh, uh, urban sprawl index lacks a measure of uncertainty. This could be a problem if interventions and resource allocations are determined by uh, arbitrary cutoff points based on those uh, uh, quant quant quantile maps. Uh, finally, very few studies assessed how urban sprawl evolves over time, thus largely ignoring the temporal dimension. Uh, next slide, please. So the aim of the, to address these uh, limitations, this research develops a spatial factor analysis model to uh, analyze multiple correlated and spatially structured urban sprawl indicators. So from this model, a uh, composite urban sprawl index for nationwide Canada at the census tract level in 2016 will be derived. Uh, the uncertainty associated with urban sprawl estimations is also explored. In particular, we use uh, the probability of an area falling into the lowest quantile uh, to quantify this kind of uncertainty. Finally, uh, the composite score will be distributed online for public and research use. Uh, next slide, please. So to construct the composite sprawl score, we used uh, nine indicators uh, that belong to four sprawl dimensions. 
And these dimensions and indicators have been widely used to uh, characterize urban sprawl in the U.S. and other countries in the world. Uh, all these indicators were derived at the census tract level. Uh, in total, uh, there are uh, 5,452 census tracts in Canada. Currently, we use uh, gross population density and gross employment density to re represent the density dimension. Uh, mixed use uh, is a uh, uh, land use mix from Shetland's entropy, of which the value uh, ranges between 0 and 1 when the land is developed evenly with different land use types, such as uh, residential, commercial, industrial land uses, it is assumed to be perfectly mixed with a value one. And to represent uh, centering, we use uh, the coefficient of variation in population uh, and employment densities. Coefficient of variation is a measure of uh, dispersion. It is the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean of an indicator. The larger the value, the higher the centralization. Uh, here, the standard deviation and mean are based on the values of dissemination areas, which is, a, is the smallest uh, census area in Canada within a census tract. Finally, uh, the street accessibility dimension uh, is represented by four sprawl indicators, including average area size, uh, the percentage of small areas, uh, which we use uh, 0.1 square mile as a criterion, and, uh, and third is, uh, the third is uh, inter intersection density for urban and suburban areas. And the last one is a percentage of four or more way uh, inter intersections in the census tract. Next slide, please. We used a spatial factor analysis model to derive uh, the composite sprawl score. Uh, factor analysis uh, is a statistical method that describes the variation and correlation of a set of observable and correlated indicators with a lower number of latent factors. Uh, conceptually, urban sprawl is unobservable, but manifests in multiple correlated sprawl indicators as shown before. So in this sense, factor analysis is a suitable approach to derive the composite score. A spatial version of factor analysis is used in our case, as we found that uh, those sporal indicators, as mentioned, are spatially autocorrelated based on Marin's eye, which means adjacent areas have similar values, suggesting that similar composite uh, sporal score could also be found in neighboring census tracts. Next slide, please. So the model is uh, implemented with uh, the Bayesian approaches. Uh, compared with the traditional frequentist methods, this approach is more flexible uh, in uh, estimating urban sprawl for census tracts with missing sprawl indicators. For example, more than 160 census tracts have missing employment rates. So the Bayesian approach treats these missing values as unknown parameters rather than uh, removing them from the analysis. Also, uh, this Bayesian approach uh, estimates the uncertainties associated with a composite sprawl score because it gives a probability distribution for each census tract. So we can also map, for example, uh, the probability that a census tract falls into the category with the highest urban sprawl, as mentioned before. So here is the model specification. YKI is the k sprawl indicator at census tract I, and FI uh, is the derived composite sprawl score and delta k is a factor loading of each sprawl indicator on the composite sprawl score. Next slide, please. So the factor loading uh, reflects the relevance between uh, each individual sprawl indicators and the composite sprawl score. Based on the modeling, we found that all the nine sprawl indicators are significant to define urban sprawl, given that uh, the 95% credible interval of their factor loading does not cover zero. And the magnitude of the factor loadings uh, represents the relative contributions of each indicator in defining the composite sprawl score. So we can see that the uh, population density, the employment density, and the coefficient of variation in employment have the largest contribution in defining the, uh, the composite sprawl score while land use mix has the lowest contribution. Uh, next slide, please. 
So here are some uh, sprawl, uh, 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 here we show some uh, the sprawl score for some cities or regions in Canada. Uh, areas in red means they are most sprawled or least compact, and areas in dark blue are those least sprawled or most compact areas. Uh, the first example is in uh, St. John's in Newfoundland. We can see that the most sprawled areas locate in the peripheral areas, and the most compact areas locate in downtown St. John's and central Mount Paul, and this makes sense in reality. Next slide, please. A second example is the region of Waterloo, uh, where I did my uh, PhD. So while the pattern is reasonable in general, for example, uh, uptown Waterloo is most compact, and uh, the most sprawl areas locate at large sense tracks in the peripheral uh, areas. What is uh, also interesting is that the university areas, uh, where the University of Waterloo and Laurier University locate, are characterized as most sprawled. Probably because, for example, uh, a sense tract uh, in, these, uh, in these university areas has only one dissemination area inside. So uh, some sprawl indicators, such as the percentage of small areas or the coefficient of variation in population and employment density is zero. So this contributes or leads to a higher sprawl score. Next slide, please. The last example is the sprawl score for Montreal, uh, where the pattern is more mixed. But we can see that generally, uh, downtown area is less sprawled or more compact compared with uh, other sense tracks. Uh, some sense tracks, for example, the airport area is found to be most sprawled. So these are the, so some examples based on our current analysis, but we did face uh, some challenges which are worth mentioning here. Next slide, please. So the first challenge is related to uh, the calculation of land use mix. Uh, currently, we assume that uh, land use is best mixed when the percentage of each land use type is equal. But this is theoretically problematic. For example, based on the uh, entropy index we use now, uh, the airport area in Montreal has a higher land use mix than some downtown areas in the city, probably because uh, those downtown areas do not have some land use types, such, such as industrial. So which leads to uh, the questions in terms of, do we need a reference geography? For example, uh, the metropolitan area, which is assumed to well mixed in land uses for calculating land use mix in other areas. Also, what land use types should be included in the calculation? Next slide, please. A second challenge we had is uh, conceptualizing the sprawl indicators. So different ratios or criteria might be used to define the same sprawl indicator in different countries. For example, in the case of defining a small area, the US study used uh, 0 0.01 a square mile which is the size of a typical urban block uh, to, uh, as a small area. But in the case of Canada, the median size of a dissimulation area is 0 0.1 square mile. And that's also the criteria we used for, for the current analysis. Also, what are median to high urban densities? In the US, uh, the criteria is uh, 12,500 person per square uh, mile, uh, but the median density in Canada is 8,000 only. So all these lead to uh, concept conceptualizing challenges in our analysis. Next slide, please. So what's next? First, we will create the probability maps of sense tracks that fall into the lowest quantile of uh, compactness or highest quantile of a sprawl, as mentioned before. So due to the computational difficulties, we uh, have not finished running the model, but we're close. Uh, second, we will do sensitivity analysis of conceptualizing the different sprawl indicators. For example, use a different threshold to uh, define small areas and examine how the different cutoff points affect the final findings.
We will also link the created composite sporal score with health data uh, from uh, Canada Community Health Survey and, uh, and examine if the sporal score helps to ex uh, explain differences in uh, behaviors or health outcomes, including uh, physical activity and BMI. Next slide, please. We also aim to uh, prepare a technical report that clar clarifies uh, the process of creating the composite sprawl score, uh, including deriving indicators from the raw data sets. For example, GIS operations used uh, to calculate the percentage of four or more way intersection density in a sense tract, and as well as the details of the statistical modeling. Once we have the results, we will publish them online for public and research use. And we hope this research will facilitate uh, nationwide environmental health studies and compare health uh, studies within different settings. And after ex exploring the spatial patterns of uh, urban sprawl in Canada, we will also investigate how urban sprawl evolved in the past two, uh, two decades using a spatial temporal statistical model. And that's what we got so far for the uh, urban sprawl research. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, I'm going to hand that over to Nancy. All right, so thank you very much, Henry, for talking about urban sprawl. And I think you've raised a few things that we can absolutely uh, discuss, maybe chat about in terms of what we measure at the scale at which we measure things and so on in this domain. So thank you very much. Um, what, uh, what I'd like to do today and what uh, Tom is uh, going to help me with. So my name is Nancy Ross. I'm a professor of geography at McGill University, uh, and I've had a long-standing interest in the social and built environment determinants of human health. Uh, I have with me today Thomas Herman, who's a research assistant in our research group here, and he's going to talk you through some of the technical aspects of the metrics that we've been working on to measure active living environment potential uh, in areas across the country. Next slide, please. Uh, so many of you will be uh, familiar with the term uh, walkability or walking friendliness, and I'll explain in a minute why we've really shifted away from that terminology. And there's been a real uptick in the interest in this from a public health perspective over time. You can see a little graph on the right that shows sort of an exponential increase and a little bit of a leveling up potentially of interest in um, neighborhoods that are conducive to physical activity uh, from a public health perspective. Conceptually appealing, right, walking low cost, a low barrier to entry activity. If we think about jurisdictions around the world struggling uh, with a policy response to try to curb uh, obesity and overweight, and they scratch their heads and they haven't come up with, uh, with uh, many viable options. Next slide, please. So uh, just to give you a flavor of the type of research that one might do with a measure of an environment that supports uh, physical activity, I'll give you a couple of examples from students that have come out of our research group in the last couple of years. So this is a, a piece by Rania Wasfi, who followed uh, thousands of individuals on the National Population Health Survey and looked at how walking friendly the neighborhood was and outcome, an outcome like body mass index while accounting for other factors that we are, know, are known to be associated with walking behaviors. And it shows that Living in a walkable neighborhood, if that's the dotted blue line at the bottom, if you lived in a high walkable neighborhood over time, you had the most favorable BMI trajectory. If you lived in a low walkable neighborhood, those are the dotted dashed lines at the very top, uh, you had the most unfavorable um, BMI trajectory over time. And the green and red lines are perhaps the most interesting because we were able to follow people who moved into and out of uh, neighborhoods that were more or less walking friendly. So the green line shows the potential of a walkable neighborhood to uh, actually deflect uh, the trajectory downward and much more favorable as, as men age. Uh, so this was a quite a powerful finding. And then individuals who left a walkable neighborhood for a less walkable neighborhood ended up with the most uh, unfavorable BMI trajectories over time. And again, we account for lots of things uh, in the modeling here. So it's fairly good evidence that we need to pay attention to the type of neighborhoods that people live in for many uh, important uh, public health outcomes. Next slide, please. So just as another example of uh, the research that uh, we can do uh, with a metric that measures the walking friendliness slash activity friendliness of a neighborhood, this is some work using the Canadian, Community, uh, Canadian Health Measures Survey looking at um, 
cardiometabolic, cardiometabolic markers, so under the skin measures, like the neighborhood getting under the skin here. We think about systolic blood pressure on the right-hand side and BMI on the left-hand side, and these are clinical measures uh, showing that they are graded by uh, levels of uh, activity friendliness of neighborhoods. So the most unfriendly activity neighborhoods, Q1, down to the more uh, walkable slash activity friendly neighborhoods at Q4, showing a better uh, cardiometabolic profile. And that's accounting for lots of other uh, factors as well. Next slide, please. So just walkability and moving towards this activity uh, friendly environment terminology. When we did some work using CHMS, we found that active uh, environments were associated with self-reported utilitarian walking, and that self-reported self utilitarian walking, that's walking for a purpose like shopping or to go to work or to school, was also associated with daily steps. There was no direct link between favorable active living environments and daily step, step counts as measured by accelerometers. And why that is, which is kind of counterintuitive, is that the, the active living environments support a swath of activity including cycling, which doesn't really uh, get picked up on the accelerometers very well. So active living environments are absolutely supportive of uh, physical activity. They're supportive of moderate to vigorous physical activity as well, but it's, there's no obvious link to step count. So it's really important that we shifted our terminology there to active living environment. Next, next slide, please. So just again, just a little bit of justification of, of switching the terminology, the importance of cycling, the importance of uh, activity that's uh, maybe wheelchair-based, uh, uh, active transportation, walking to transit stations, and so on, made us really rethink the term. So that's reflected here in the slide. And now I'm going to I'm going to turn this the talk over to Tom, who's really going to walk us through the active living environment indicator for all of Canada. And this is, I think this is the time and place to get into some details on the measure. So Tom's going to show us some, some of the nitty gritties, because I think this audience probably is really interested in some of the decisions that we had to make uh, in terms of making the measure. And again, we, the objective here was to provide a measure that we could share widely both with other researchers and with policymakers, so we can share this with our municipal government. We can share this with the Public Health Agency of Canada or Statistics Canada or any other government agency that wants it because we're using open source data. And this was a big, um, I don't know, a big objective that we really wanted to uh, deliver on for the metric. And so Tom's going to walk you through some of that. Well, over to Tom. Next slide, please. Great. Um, thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> and thank you all for uh, joining us today. So um, as Nancy said, I'll talk a little bit about the specifics of the data set that we're ready to deliver um, within the next few weeks, which we're calling the Canadian Active Living Environment Measure, or CAN-AIL. Um, so CAN-AIL is a national data set of GIS, or Geographic Information Systems-based measures, um, for two census years. So we have a 2006 and 2016 data set. It's based on one kilometer circular buffers around dissemination area centroids. Um, as Nancy mentioned, we derived all of the measures using free and open data sources, so any potentially interested uh, end user will be able to download it directly from us. Um, the entire, we're going to walk through this a little bit, but all the measures we selected uh, partly on the basis of their association with both walking behavior and active transportation use, Oftentimes, active transport just refers to walking and cycling, but we're also including public transit use because uh, of the active transit that happens between to and from uh, stops or stations. Next slide, please. So this is a brief summary of the two kind of big analyses we did uh, to validate our data set. So we did two analyses, one for the island of Montreal and one for all of Canada. They varied in a few different ways. We used a different walking or physical activity measure um, to validate our measures. Um, so in the Montreal case, we had access to a great uh, local origin destination survey, the Montreal OD survey, which is done by a regional transportation agency and focuses on walking for transportation. So uh, walking to and from any place, work, school, uh, shopping, or to a friend or family's house, for instance, um, it, that covers adults aged 18 to 65. Uh, for the Canadian level analysis, we looked at census journey to work data, so that's only walking to work. Uh, we did that both, again, for walking and for active transportation or walking, cycling, public transit. Uh, we also 
had a few different ways that these analyses varied. Um, the first analysis really kind of focused on the GIS methodology we were going to use for these measures and the type of buffer, the type of uh, polygonal unit we wanted to use to represent neighborhoods and communities across Canada. So we tried two circular buffers and two street network-based buffers. They varied in terms of the size of their radius. And for the Canadian level analysis, we looked at uh, dissemination areas and postal codes for the unit of analysis. And we were mostly looking into the data sources, what, what are the best data sources we could use to deliver this measure. Next slide, please. So this is a really brief summary of the uh, measures that we selected, and we'll walk through some of these decisions a little bit further. Um, but for the 2006 data set, um, there was only available uh, non-proprietary data to derive three-way intersection density and dwelling density. But for the 2016 data set, we have a pan-Canadian coverage of three-way intersection density, dwelling density, and points of interest, or destination density. And we also have coverage for about 65% of Canada, or all of the census metropolitan areas. Those are big cities with 100,000 people or more um, of transit stops. So that's any sort of transit stop, bus, rail, um, or whatever's in that area. Let's go to the next slide, please. So I would, uh, I'll just take the opportunity now to talk a little bit about uh, this open source nature of the data set, which is a little bit novel and innovative, and um, hopefully you'll be able to understand some of our decisions a little bit better. The next slide. Um, I'll talk really briefly about um, OpenStreetMap, uh, which is the data set we use to derive both intersection density or connectivity and points of interest. OpenStreetMap um, is obviously very appealing because of its unrestricted terms of use, but there's a lot of really unique things about OpenStreetMap beyond that. Um, the contributors tend to be local and they tend to spot errors really quickly. Um, they get corrected and add points that perhaps someone uh, from far away um, wouldn't know of or uh, or simply not know where to look for these things. So one of the nice things about OpenStreetMap contributors is they tend to be local, and the data becomes more detailed over time, and that's something that's written about extensively, um, especially in the European context. Um, but uh, the, the data tends to be continuously updated. Things are not only added, but edited, um, and that's a really appealing thing as well. This is a measure that's kind of aging nicely like wine over time. Um, the uh, the way that OpenStreetMap classifies data is also based on um, some international standards, and they're trying to standardize this across the world. So there's really some nice things that improved our GIS accuracy when deriving some of these measures, and I'll walk through those briefly. There are some disadvantages, of course. There's limited temporal replicability of analyses. Um, so no two are going to be the same because the data isn't bundled all at the same time in the same way census data is, for instance. Um, and there's also also some sentiments about bias and coverage, but uh, we hope to address that a little bit in the next slides. So we can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, one of the measures we used uh, OpenStreetMap for was creating our street connectivity measure. So the street connectivity measure, three-way intersection density, really benefited from OpenStreetMap's really uh, detailed road classification scheme. Um, in many ways. Some of those ways is that they classify highway entrances and exits very well. They identify these slip roads, um, which are any sort of auxiliary road. Um, it's a dedicated right turn lane, dedicated left turn lane. It's a break in a boulevard median. Um, it's an access road um, on the side of a highway. It's, it's really roads that are auxiliary to major roads. Um, and it also has extensive coverage of footpaths and multi-use recreational trails, which we were able to include in our connectivity measure as well. Um, the validity and completeness of the road network data is, re is probably the best documented um, part of OpenStreetMap's um, available data, and it often comes from authoritative sources in the first place. So here in Canada, a great example of that is the Canvec products from Natural Resources Canada. There's a number of uh, there's a number of contributors who have a very systematic several page document about putting that data um, into OpenStreetMap. They're kind of doing it on a need to go basis, so in the most populated areas of the country first. Um, but that's really detailed, um, you know, taxpayer paid data, which should be open to everybody. And it's really great getting that on there. And then once that is on there, users contribute and make it even more detailed. So it's a really unique data set. Go to the next slide. So just briefly on this point of slip roads and the dedicated turn lanes and things like that, that is one of the ways that we were really able to improve our connectivity measure. So you can see here, this is an ordinary commercial area in Victoria, BC. Those blue lines are all of the roads that would show up on a GIS 
um, that could be that is the OpenStreetMap data, but it would look very similar with the Statistics Canada road network file or with the DMTI road network file. And then there's just a little screenshot from Google Street View of what that area looks like for you on the right. Go to the next slide. So now highlighted in blue, you'll see the areas that are these flip roads I'm talking about. And in this particular case, it's mostly dedicated right turn lanes, like the image on the right, and driveways into private businesses. So these are not true intersections, if you will. If we go to the next slide, you can see that a GIS um, without any classification would read each of these uh, road segments as an individual road and map each of these uh, points where a right turn, a very simple right turn lane like the one on the right connecting two roads, it would count that as two separate intersections. Um, so uh, if we go to the next slide, we will see what that looks like in real life. So this is a somewhat complicated intersection on the right, and the green dots are the true intersections. They actually join two or more roads. The red dots are simply the right turn lanes that were pictured in the last slide. And why that's important is because these slip roads and turn lanes are actually proxies for car friendliness. So it's actually difficult to navigate this type of intersection as a pedestrian, but we're confounding our measure when we keep these types of road segments in our estimation of intersection density because it looks like it's a very highly connected area where in reality it's actually quite difficult to navigate this area as a pedestrian. On the next slide, you'll see what it looks like with the OpenStreetMap road classification. So the OSM classification, which shows us where those slip roads are very, very nicely, gives us 31 intersections versus 60, which we would have calculated before using either the Statistics Canada or DMTI data set. So it's a really unique part of OpenStreetMap um, that we're very happy about. Going on to the next slide, the other measure that we used with OpenStreetMap was this point of interest measure. Um, this is very similar to density destination density measures that have existed in this type of research for quite a long time. Um, some of you may be uh, familiar with the DMTI uh, enhanced points of interest or EPOI data set. Um, that's a proprietary data set that's available to university researchers, but it's difficult to disseminate outside of the university context because the user needs a license. Um, it has good coverages of business and government institutions because the primary customer of uh, DMTI tends to be um, tends to be businesses that are looking to locate their business or something like that. So businesses and government institutions, especially ones that are on the tax records, are very well documented. Um, there is, however, limited coverage of important non-business or government features, such as parks, tennis courts, uh, swimming pools, beaches, especially some of these recreation or leisure type points of interest uh, because they're not official businesses. So DMTI isn't necessarily interested in that because of their customers. Um, but these are really important um, is really important amenities when we think about how people move around in their neighborhood and what they do in their neighborhood and the types of physical activities that the neighborhood supports. Um, the OSO MPOIs are free to use and the points are more uh, oriented towards wayfinding. So it's more like what you would see if you log on to Google Maps. Um, it includes shops, schools, parks, benches, things that are of general interest um, to people. So we'll go to the next slide. Two things we wanted to make sure before we dove in and use this uh, OSM POI data set was looking at the consistency of the coverage across Canada. So we looked at various different regions of Canada, as you can see here. Across Canada, the proportion of OSM POIs to DMTI POIs is about 32%, and that really doesn't change too much depending in which province you look at. Um, we also did a similar analysis in Quebec looking at urban, suburban, and rural environments. Um, and the one thing, the other thing I would note is that OSM and DMTI are fundamentally different data sets. So this doesn't necessarily mean that OSM is incomplete. It just means that OSM is trying to show different points of interest, and it does that in a consistent way across Canada, just like the DMTI data set does. On the next slide, um, we'll see the association with walking to work rates from the census. So uh, we did this across the country, and we saw that both the DMTI and the OSM POIs are very strongly associated with walking to work across Canada. And again, um, they did very well um, at the regional level as well. There's no real clear winner between DMTI and OSM when you look at this at the regional level. So we'll go to the next slide. We'll just go through uh, two more decisions that we did that mostly 
uh, focused on representing different neighborhoods and communities and the type of unit of analysis that we used for this uh, for this data set. So the next slide, please. Um, the first thing we looked at is different buffer sizes and different buffer shapes. So in Montreal, as I mentioned earlier, we had four different types of uh, buffers that we constructed. We constructed two circular and two street network-based buffers. They varied in terms of the radius, 500 meters, and one kilometer for both. Um, we tried 12 different measures of walkability or active living environments, um, and what we found was the measures that were derived using the circular one kilometer buffer tended to be um, the most highly associated with walking for transport. So this is using our data for, uh, for walking for transport from the Montreal Origin Destination Survey. The one exception is land use mix, which was a little bit better at network one kilometer buffer, but everything else was really good at the circular one kilometer level. Oh, next slide, please. Um, so to illustrate uh, another another artifact of uh, circular versus network buffers, um, we also saw on the island of Montreal that the size of the network buffers, which are shaded in blue, um, vary a lot according to the uh, type of neighborhood environment. So if you look in a suburban location on the left versus the urban location at the right, the urban location pretty much fills out um, the area uh, of the circular buffer, but the buffer in the suburban location is much smaller. On the next slide, we'll see how this translates into actually calculating measures. So for our street connectivity measure, um, our, our three-way intersection density, if you use the network buffers in the suburban location, the area is much smaller, so you're getting very different measures. As you can see on the bottom left, the intersection density for the circular one kilometer buffer um, is 14 kilometers, uh, 14 intersections per kilometer squared versus network buffer, which is almost three times higher. So we'll go on the next slide. The one other decision we took up uh, about the unit of analysis was whether to use dissemination areas or postal codes. And given all of the kinds of criteria that we've already talked about, um, the dissemination areas won out. So there's a lot of advantages of using dissemination areas. They're non-proprietary, relatively stable geographic units. Um, there's also, because of that reason, there are fewer potential aggregation and data linkage issues. Um, these are census geographies, and it's very easy to link census data with them. Um, for researchers that are used to working with postal codes, there's also uh, geographic conversion tools like the PCCF Plus, which you can either order from a university if you're affiliated with one, or from Statistics Canada. The link is at the bottom. Um, and there's also, um, perhaps most importantly, really good coverage of the different types of environments in Canada, so the urban, suburban, rural issue again. Um, to take an example, um, about 19% of Canadians live in rural areas or outside of CMAs or CAs or outside of a population center of 10,000 people or more. Um, the dissemination areas, uh, using this definition, uh, the dissemination areas cover about 23%. 23% uh, of the dissemination areas, rather, are in rural areas, but only 10% of the postal codes are in rural areas. So there's a real d difference in the coverage of rural areas using postal codes. On the next slide, very quickly, we'll just show you two different communities in Quebec. One is an urban neighborhood in Montreal, Côte St. Paul on the left, and one is Acton Vale, um, Quebec on the right. Um, they're somewhat similar in population. Cote St. Paul is a bit larger, but Acton Vale, the municipality at least, is about 10 times larger in geographic size. On the next slide, you'll see the dissemination area, uh, the distribution of dissemination areas in these two places. Um, the dissemination areas are normalized by population. So in both Cote St. Paul and Acton Vale, the population is about four to 500 people in each. On the next slide, you will see where the postal codes in these places are. Um, postal codes in urban areas tend to be very dense across the street from one another, uh, and they're a good proxy of residential location. However, in rural areas, as you can see on the right, there's only one postal code for all of Actonville, Quebec, which is trying to typify the types of environments that 8,000 people are living in. And you can see from the satellite imagery that Actonville consists of both a urban center in the middle, but also there's a farming community surrounding that. So the, the places where people live in Actonville are actually very diverse and heterogeneous, and we need a better measure than postal codes to try to capture that. On the next slide, we'll start wrapping up and uh, just describe very briefly a few things that we've done to make this a flexible tool uh, for different people in the research and policy communities. 
On the next slide, this is a brief summary of what you can expect to find in the data set. So there's a lot of different measures to work with and play with. Um, we, of course, will have the individual measures, both a raw value and a z-score for each of the measures that we've described today. Uh, we also have a summarized index, or AL index, um, which is the sum z-score of the uh, measures that are available for all of Canada, and then the AL transit index, which is a summarized index only for the census metropolitan areas. So um, it's very similar to the AL index, but it includes the transit measure as well. And then we also have uh, AL class variable, which is a categorical measure of the favorability of the active living environment from one to five or very low to very high. Um, we did that based on a k-means cluster classification. K, excuse me, k-medians cluster classification. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> on the next slide, um, so you can see that the ale index, which is really um, which is available for all of Canada um, using the measures that you see uh, on the left. Um, this, this is really well suited to research. So it's correlated to uh, walking to work rates across Canada. Um, it's also strongly correlated to active tr uh, transit to work rates. Again, the walking, cycling, or transit use to work rates across Canada. On the next slide, you'll see a uh, correlation matrix of the walking and active transit to work rates and the AL measures only for the big cities in Canada or the CMAs. Um, and again, uh, the correlations uh, with walking to work rates in the first column and active transit to work rates on the next column. On the next slide, you can see this AL class variable. So these are four different urban areas across Canada, Montreal, Charlottetown, Hamilton, and Calgary. Um, and you can see they're shaded from the very low uh, favorability, favorability active living environment in red to the very high in dark green. Um, there's a lot of that in Montreal. On the next slide, this is just trying to capture how this classification worked a little bit, this ill class variable. So this is an example of low category residential neighborhoods in those four different places. Um, so this is the second lowest out of five categories. Um, and you can see what the residential streets look like. And on the next slide, you can see what the commercial streets look like. Um, they're very similar neighborhoods, which is pretty impressive considering they're in very different parts of the country. Um, and the commercial environments and the residential environments tend to be uh, quite similar. On the next slide, you can see an example of uh, high category neighborhoods. This is the fourth out of the fifth highest levels. So this isn't downtown Vancouver. This isn't downtown Toronto. This is fourth out of fifth. Um, this is what the residential neighborhoods look like. And on the next slide, you can see um, an example of the commercial environments in those neighborhoods. What strikes us about this classification and what it brings up really well is that there isn't a radical difference between the low or the high category neighborhoods across Canada. They tend to be single family home neighborhoods. They tend to have shops. They tend to be pretty average middle class neighborhoods, but the way that they are built is different. And because of that, uh, the way that people get around in their neighborhoods and because of that, their, um, sometimes their health can be quite different. So this isn't really a radical difference we're looking at between neighborhoods. Again, this isn't the downtown Toronto to the, the downtown Vancouver, um, but these are modest different design changes uh, or differences between neighborhoods, which is um, an exciting area of research uh, that we hope a lot of people take up and kind of look at the differences between some of these neighborhoods. So on the next slide, just summarizing very quickly, we have a nationwide data set available very soon. Um, we have done everything we can to try to make it simple and free to use, um, making it easy for data linkage with existing national level health surveys with local data. Of course, this is coming as a CSV, a comma separated values file, so it's very easy to add your own data as well. Um, we're going to have a technical document explaining how each of these measures uh, were estimated. So if um, you want to do some of your own or you want to tweak um, a little bit based on your research needs, that's available to you as well. It will be available in both English and French. Um, and in addition to those two user guides, uh, we will have the 2006 and 2016 data sets. We expect that that will be available in mid-March. It's being piloted by a few people right now. Um, and on the next slide, um, I just want to say thank you to everybody who's made this possible. Um, 
this is something we want to have a really wide impact on the research and policy community in Canada. Um, so we're interested in having you have it um, and, and seeing what you think and, and getting your feedback. Um, if, as I said, we're expecting this is going to be available in mid-March. Um, if you're interested in receiving an email when it is available, it's going to be available from our website, but you can go on our website right now. Um, the link is right there on the screen, nancyresearchgroup.ca slash can dash ale. And there's a form there where you can leave your email and we will give you an email as soon as it is, it's available. So thank you all so much for being uh, here with us today and we look forward to discussing this a little bit further. Thank you, Thomas and Nancy. And we're just going to finish up before we have uh, questions with uh, Daniel. Talk a little bit about the uh, walkability meeting and neighborhood factors team. Um, so basically, I'm just going to give a quick summary, a couple minutes of um, the walkability meeting that we had in November in St. John's as part of um, CANOE and uh, give some, quick, some brief updates on what's happening with the CANOE um, neighborhood factors team, sort of where we're at and where we're going and hopefully get some input from uh, the folks on the line. Um, so the walkability meeting had the objectives of discussing the future of walkability measures, um, developing a conceptual definition of walkability, um, and outlining new and emerging methods for walkability. Um, so we had expected outcomes um, and we're working towards a working paper. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, so the conceptual paper for walkability um, is in development. So as Nancy kind of alluded to at the beginning of her talk, um, the term walkability is quite sticky, but it probably doesn't represent the kinds of environments that we're describing when we talk about walkability. And active living environments is probably um, a good start on how we describe these things, but we're trying to get at sort of a conceptual definition of what this might look like. Um, you've just heard a little bit about can ale, which is great. Um, and one of the other things, really big things that came out of the walkability meeting was how can we um, scale up the measurement of what people in the walkability community call microscale features, so things like benches or things like sidewalk quality or things like um, curb cuts, for example, that you know are not well described in any of the GIS type data that we have available now, um, but are important for people's ability to um, get around and navigate in different spaces. So. Um, the CANOE uh, Neighborhood Factors team is currently working with um, a group uh, called a group who's developed a, a citizen science project called Bike Maps, uh, where people can report um, cycling incidents. And we're sort of thinking about maybe calling this thing Walk, walk Maps, but we'll see where where that goes um, in the future. Um, so the other things that are happening in the Neighborhood Factors team, um, one of the big focuses uh, that's being led by Dr. Michael Widener at U of T is um, on developing something similar to what you've seen related to um, walkability and sprawl uh, related to food environments. Um, so there is a recent meeting with Statistics Canada about um, getting the food environment registry data, and I think Nancy's been involved in that, um, and starting to be able to create some food environment data that would be available at the national level for Canada. Um, we are currently working on uh, public transit accessibility measures. Um, so um, we're hoping that we'll be able to release um, some public transit accessibility measures. So simple measures like number of counts, the count of transit stops in a DA, um, and sort of more complex measures that account for um, the number of transit stops um, using a buffer, accounting for the number of transit stops, the variety of routes, the frequency of routes, and the population within an area to try to um, understand sort of how people, whether people can get around using transit um, in their, where they live. Um, we're also following closely with the, uh, with sort of neighborhood or area level income measures. Um, so CANMARGE is currently, so CANMARGE is Canadian Marginalization Inject developed by Jim Dunn. Um, the Neighborhood Factors team is currently working with StatCan, I think Jim's mostly working on that to um, recalculate the CANMARGE for um, a bunch of different census years, I think going back uh, to 1991 until present so that we can 
we can and you can um, link can merge data with um, either your health survey data and hopefully your longitudinal survey data um, so that we can try to look at changes in um, marginalization over time. We're also keeping up with the uh, Institut National de Santé Publique de Québec to try to um, see what's happening with their deprivation index. So they've released the 2016 version of what people may know as the Pamplon Index, um, and they're currently working on uh, developing a new version of what of the Pamplon Index. So they'll continue calculating the previous version, and they're working on releasing a new sort of um, deprivation index um, that we're following up with them on. Uh, the last thing here is. Um, Part of the work that I'm doing is related to using apps for research. So this summer, there'll be a student working on a white paper on if people are using apps for their research, sort of what's, what are good things to know, uh, what are challenges, how can you go about doing this, what's the best way to go. Um, so we're working on that. Next slide. And the last, uh, at the neighborhood, so at the walkability meeting, the other, the last sort of couple hours or hour of the session, we sort of said, ask the participants, you know, what are you hearing from local communities? What are you hearing from your partners around what do they need and what would they want in terms of um, national measurements for, um, that could be associated with health, health outcomes, but that also would be useful to have at a national level. Um, the one thing I think we heard the most lo loudly was some measures of housing affordability. Um, and we also heard uh, potentially interest in measures of gentrification. Now, I am not an expert in housing affordability or gentrification, um, but I think that part of the mandate of the Neighborhood Factors team is to you know, reach out to the experts that we need to be able to, uh, that we think could help us try to develop or calculate some national housing affordability or gentrification measures. And I would love to hear from sort of others here today uh, who might have thoughts on other sort of neighborhood factors me measures outside of what you've heard sort of today and from the list that might be relevant or interesting for CANU to start looking at in terms of, um, you know, what we could do and what we could try to create at the, at the national level. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you, Daniel. I'm just going to open things up here, see if we have any questions. Chat line. Very interesting talk. Lots of work that has been done and is going on and to be done. And, uh, Mute everybody. Here we go. Uh, Evan Seed has a question. Will there be any attempt to look at the seasonality of the Can Ale example, navigating cities in summer versus winter and effects of snow cover, freeze thaw cycles, ice conditions, winter severity in different cities? So, uh, so that's, it's Nancy. I'll, I'll just respond. There's a simple answer, which is no, and there's a more complex answer, <laughs> which is um, I think all of the things that you raise are important in terms of people's mobility for sure, uh, but these measures are definitely not, um, they are, they are uh, 2D measures on a computer. They will never capture anything about the weather, uh, and we really, it's really about the built environment that's probably more permanent than seasons, I guess, if you think about it that way. Um, but so yeah, no, there would be nothing there. I mean, when we think about predicting walking, though, I think Evan's point's well taken. If you're predicting walking, especially for older individuals, you know, things like sidewalk uh, snow removal and um, the weather conditions and so on, we know there's a step deficit that the weather causes, and uh, it's it's about a thousand steps uh, in uh, lower in the winter than in the summer. So the research is really really good around this. Uh, these metrics will never capture that. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Michael Brower has a question for uh, Daniel. Have you thought about image, Google Street View plus machine learning analysis for micro scale features? Uh, thanks, Mike. Yeah, um, we have thought about this. So CANU has been working on acquiring Google data for um, a number of different cities. Um, and the ch I think there's a few, I think it's doable. I think there are some challenges related to um, the data costs. And um, so the data costs and then, you know, what we can measure using these micro scale features. Um, there are people working on this, I think, in different pockets sort of around the country for these kind of micro scale features. For the moment, I think, like from the canoe perspective, I'm not really pushing it very hard because I think... I see enough pockets of work kind of happening with other things that Canoe is doing related to um, 
to uh, climate change using uh, Street View methods or AI kind of methods using Street View and sort of other groups working on this. So I'm not pushing it really hard for neighborhood factors right now because I think there's like pockets of work happening in other places that hopefully we can we can pull from. Okay, thank you. Another question from uh, Tanya Christidis. Hi, great work by everyone. I have a question about sprawl. I wonder if this is something that needs to be defined at a city level or at the very least not nationally. Does sprawl look different in St. John's versus Montreal versus Calgary? Uh, so it's Daniel Fuller here. Um, yeah, this is one of the... so. For the moment, we're calling it sprawl, and we're not sure that we are going to continue calling it sprawl. Um, yeah, because it's like, it seems like sprawl is a feature of the city itself or sort of a, C a CMA level feature. And maybe more like what we're measuring is, you know, area level compactness or area level um, sort of density or some kind of combination of those things rather than a concept like sprawl. Um, so that's one comment. I think the other thing that Henry sort of raised in his talk was this idea of, a, of reference measures. So, you know, if, if we would, for example, if we decided to take some city as a reference and say, okay, this is the reference measure for, um, for sprawl or compactness, um, then we could potentially um, use that reference and say, well, compared to this place that we know what it looks like, this place is more or less compact or sprawling than, than this other place. So I think that, that yeah, those, that, those are always challenges with these kind of city level, national versus local kind of calculations. I have another question from MV. When considering buffer sizes for can ale, was there any discussion or consideration of 500 meter, one kilometer, and the 400 meter, 800 meter measures, which are often used in practice by municipalities and transit agencies? So maybe I'll answer that. So, um, yeah, we've been working um, in the area of walkability and health. I, you know, I keep using the word myself, even though we're trying to change it. Uh, and um, over time, and I've played with buffer sizes quite a lot. Uh, from the research side of things. And one of the, the thinking on this one in particular was maximizing the correlation with the walking rate. And so uh, that was really the decision. Um, the, the correlations are, are sensitive to buffer size, but not super sensitive to buffer size. And so, I mean, a lot of people do focus on buffer sizes and, and sensitivities around it. We have looked at it. It really doesn't make that much difference. And the stronger correlation tends to be with the one kilometer buffer. So we were going from a public health perspective on this uh, rather than as urban planning perspective. If you can say that those are, are separate, maybe we can, maybe we can't, we could debate it. But it was really about maximizing that um, that walking rate with the one kilometer circular buffer. And the circular buffer has so many beneficial properties. It eliminates the artifactual effects of um, street connectivity that you actually double count when you use a network buffer, for example. Um, and the computing power, uh, the computing time is incredibly different and incredibly lower uh, with the circular compared to the network buffers. And again, you know, we, we could, we could, you know, through the clamoring in the community, uh, go out and, and rerun these for different buffer sizes, and we have done so, uh, and we can present that if, if people are interested. Great. And we have one last question for our time here from Eleanor. Thanks very much for the great presentations. I'm wondering if these measures could be used as training data to classify satellite images. Would be good to try this to see if we could expand in some way. Uh, I'm not sure. Dan, what do you think? <laughs> uh, I, I think it's possible. I think the challenge with these, for classification purposes, um, um, I think the challenge is that you're, because you're, are the can ale and the sprawl index are already sort of composite indicators of something, I think that the challenge is like at the end of the day, if you take these things and then you use them to classify satellite image data, you're not 100% sure what you're getting out at the end. Like, are you getting a lot of, um, I don't know, are you getting a lot of street intersections, for example, that are driving the results or those kinds of things? Um, or are you really getting a picture of sort of the overall sprawl or walkability kind of, kind of 
kind of thing. I think that it's challenging. The other thing I, I think that's challenging is like at the, even at the DA level, it's uh, that's a big enough area in in the, in the satellite image world. I think to have lots of challenges with sort of okay, here's one score for this DA, which is the area is very in size, but the training it might not work for the training because the satellite image is going to show a lot of variation, whereas our score has like one thing for each DA. But in a satellite image, just like Thomas showed for um, Acton Vale, like that, that that DA has a lot of variability in terms of what you could classify in theory. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I really see the the satellite imagery being really helpful in public health uses. I think it's super helpful in the air pollution story. Super helpful in the NDVI story, so green space and green cover, super, super helpful, and they can be layered on this, but I wouldn't say, I, I tend to agree with you, Dan, that I don't see them being used to train anything that we're going to get any value out of on the satellite imagery. I, I, I would add to that, too. I mean, like, the, the going to the point I made about the commercial area in Victoria, BC, as well, um, there's a lot of different roadway types, and they're not all created equal. Um, so a, a driveway and a road and, and a laneway and, a, and things like that um, are all very different, and we don't necessarily want to count every intersection of pavement as an intersection, at least for the measures that we know work. Um, so I kind of agree with Nancy's perspective that there's a lot of um, possibility with using satellite imagery for greenness or for um, actually the density of just pavement for the urban heat island effect and things like that. But um, but for connectivity in, in some of these different measures, I think it's, it's, a, it's a ways until, if ever, yeah, if ever yeah. that, that we can improve on what we have right now. Okay. Well, there was one last question. Do you have time for that? Sure. Yeah, we do. Right, Justin uh, Thielman says, are there any plans to calculate the sprawl index or can ale using historical data before 2006? Historical indices could be linked to cohorts to study changes in sprawl, walkability, and changes in health outcomes. Yeah, I know that's a really important question. And, you know, we have, um, through our longitudinal studies over time, have done some of these proprietary measures over time from the late 1990s into the early 2000s and into the mid, well, into the 2010s. Uh, when we go back in time, when, we, when we're, we're now in the OpenStreetMap platform, going back in time is a little bit more challenging on the points of interest, we're sure. Uh, so we can go back in time as far as there are census data on our other two measures, which are correlated to the can L overall measure. So our, our ability to go back in time is really um, only limited by the presence of statistics Canada data. What we haven't done a good analysis of is how well does can ale register change, right? So we really don't know how sensitive it is to changes in uh, urban environments that become more walking or less walking friendly over time. You know, walk neighborhoods, the built environment is a is a is a modifiable feature of of our of our environment, but it's it is a bit sticky to use the to use dance term. It's like neighborhoods don't change their walkability drastically over time, but important changes need to be made to make walking easier, making physical activity easier. So we we do need to measure change. We just we don't know yet. I think how well our measure is at measuring change. I do feel really strongly going forward that this is going to be really good uh, to measure change. So. Um, when our kids are in university and they're measuring um, walkability in 10, 15, okay, maybe your kids, my kids are here, uh, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, we'll know the story in the future and we'll know okay in the past, but we'll know really well in the future. So if anything, CanAil, I think, is a forward-looking metric, how we surveil walkability in Canada going forward. I agree. The only thing I would add is start hoarding data now. <laughs> what do you mean? So that, well, well, just just in general. So you know, yeah. no one was thinking five years ago of like, oh, we should start collecting the historic StatCan data or the historic, you know, OpenStreetMap data. And now everyone's going, oh, we should have done that. That would have been a good plan. Um, so I, I think that's, I, that's the key. Okay. 
I will add to that, Dan. Um, I, I agree, but five or ten years ago, I don't think we would have been able to do this with the OpenStreetMap data. Um, it's, a, it's a very new phenomenon um, in a certain sense. So, I mean, I think, like, before getting too cynical, like, definitely, like, yeah, toward the data now, but, like, I think we're here at the right time. I don't think we missed the boat necessarily. Like, I think this is a good time to start doing uh, archiving and things like that, yeah, especially with data sets like that. Right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Daniel, Nancy, Henry, and Thomas for taking the time today to present your uh, very interesting work. And uh, this will um, all go up on the uh, web, uh, our canoe web page eventually. Thanks again. Thanks Great. for listening, everybody. Take yeah, care. thank you. Thank you. Bye.